that with the golds worthy. Thanks for your help tonight. If you need a handout, if you'd raise your hand as we are close to the end of our series on how to be a good parent or otherwise known as top 10 ways to ruin your children. Hope this series has been a help to you. Some are past children age, some are coming into children age, and some are in it right now. And so whatever stage you're in, hopefully some of these have been a help to you. And so I've got positive and negative feedback. I'm okay with both, trying to be true to what God has for us. But the top ten ways to ruin your children tonight is number seven. And we'll begin there. If you need a handout, just hold that hand up. Thank you, men, for helping with that. Sure appreciate that help. Appreciate all you do. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aren't you glad to be in church again? I'm glad to be in church Wednesday night, come together as a church family and see those things and love seeing those young people. I'm glad we have a church that lets, that lets kids come to church. Now, I know sometimes kids cause messes and problems at churches. I know that some of you will not like that sometimes our kids even run around the church a little bit. Some of you aren't going to like that. Now, listen, listen, unless you're the parent, unless they're breaking something, or hurting someone, let it be. Now, as parents, if you want your kids not to run, that's A-OK. All right, typically don't let my kids run too much around here, but I have to confess something to you. You know, confession's good for the soul, right? So we often clean Sunday afternoons, my family and I, and when the kids are real little, every time we got done cleaning, they said, Dad and Mom, can we run down the ramp as fast as we can back there? And they love that. If you don't know, there's a ramp back there. All right, right past the altar? I'm just, no, no. <laughs> That run down that ramp. I let them run down there. And you know what? They liked, they liked, being, they liked being around this place. All right? And I don't mind. Uh, you know, we typically don't want them running around the auditorium during church, but that typically doesn't happen. We don't let pretty much anyone run around during church. Remember, no plants. And don't take a lap for church. But I love having these kids around, and sometimes they'll make messes. Sometimes they'll be loud, and I'm thankful for it. Because I've been to churches where there are no children. That's a scary place. Scary place. So I'm glad we have them. Thank you for the parents. And uh, boy, I'm blessed to be here and blessed to have parents. And we're trying to help parents along the way so that we raise godly children. It is not easier in 2021. It's not easier. But if you read the Bible, it was never easy. Different struggles, different, different battles along the way. But every age, every time a period, uh, remember Eli had a problem with his sons not being restrained. Every time period had a problem with children. So it's not 2021, oh, no, now it's difficult. Now there are different battles we must face and cross, and there might be a different society at times. But listen, America has not been the worst society ever to exist. You might remember a little story about Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? So I know that we can think about, oh, you know, woe is me, this is terrible, and, and there are different battles, and I'm not saying it's just a picnic out there. We need, we need God's help. But it's not, all is not lost. We can still raise godly children, godly young men, godly women to serve Jesus Christ, whatever God calls them to serve. He may cause, call some to serve in a full-time church setting, and that's wonderful. We pray for that, some toward missionaries, but some full-time working another job. But that's okay, too. I'm proud of all our children, wherever God calls them, and I want them to follow God. All right, if that's, if that's being a pastor or an assistant pastor or a missionary, all right, or an engineer, praise God for all of that. We all have different paths, don't we? Your job, my job is to follow him. We want to raise our children that way. And uh, we don't think anyone is second class or you know, everyone, as long as they follow God. Uh, that's what we're looking for. And as parents, that's what we're looking for, parents. And so let's look tonight, begin with uh, one of those verses. I'd like to begin with Proverbs 22, verse 6, top of the page there. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, there are four principles around your sheep. I've gone over them every week, and I will not... I will not be negligent tonight. The four principles, number one, very few people are trying to ruin their children. Very few people are trying to ruin their children. Some are doing it, but most are not trying to. Number two, we are all going to make mistakes. I imagine my kids are thankful for this series because if I have to speak this and preach this up here, i got to make sure I'm doing what I'm saying. All right, so they don't like the rule part as much, but other things are right. Um, they're, they're thankful for this. Number three, we must realize... Our incorrect tendencies, actions, and attitudes, and make corrections. Not enough to know it. Not enough. Often in life, we know when we're not doing something exactly right. Holy Spirit's convicted us. We know when we have a stinking, rotten, no good attitude. 
Come on, adults, don't we know that? We don't like to correct it sometimes. We feel justified in that, do we not? Well, I'm this way because, fill in the wonderful excuse. My coworker, they said this, and if they hadn't said this, then I would have a good attitude. No, you have a rotten attitude because the flesh is living inside of you still. And you have not surrendered that part to Jesus Christ, and you're living for the devil at that moment. Just call it what it is. All right, so as parents, sometimes the Lord will touch us. We have to make corrections. And number four, God brings practical truth and help from Scripture to our parenting. The Bible is practical. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's get a word of prayer tonight. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you'd help what I say to be helpful and profitable. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be turned towards you, that you would touch us in those areas, Lord, that are incorrect, that maybe we haven't followed you completely. Would you help us to change for your honor and for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. Number seven tonight in our top ten ways to ruin your children. Number seven, if you want to ruin your kids, then be. Now, before I give you the answer, how many guessers do we have in here? All right, how, how, who would be honest? Say, listen, when I do this thing, I try to pre-fill out every blank in this scene to, to, to catch you. All right, we got some honest people. All right, and, and how many colorers do we have in here? All right, we got some colors as well. All right, all right, good. Uh, how, many, how many blank police do we have? Now, this is what I mean by blank police, all right? You're sitting next to someone, and if you miss one, they nudge you and point out that you missed a blank. Do we have any of those in here? All right, those are the worst. Those, oh, did you do that, Brother John? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, they're the worst people, right? Like, oh, you missed that one. I know, I'm getting around to it, all right? And it's like, it's like at, the, at the stoplight when it turns green, the person behind you, right? They say that's the definition of a millisecond. Between the time the light turns green, the person behind you honks. All right? Number seven, if you want to ruin your kids, then be self-centered. Be self-centered. Now let's look at tonight what that looks like in your family. We know scripturally, we'll look at some scriptural ideas as well, we know that we should not be self-centered creatures. We are naturally self-centered. We are naturally me-first people. All right, that is not because of God, that is because of the flesh. That is because of pride, because we still have a sin, uh, uh, the pull of sin in our life, even though we're saved. We know we're not supposed to be self-centered, but it can have devastating effects inside of a family unit. Devastating effects when a dad is completely or very self-centered, when a mom is very self-centered, when parents are self-centered. Now, we'll talk about what this looks like and how to somewhat balance this a little bit, all right? Because some of you are going to think instantly, well, all right, it's not supposed to be all about the kids. It's supposed to be over here. Let's talk about that. What does it look like? When we, when we are self-centered parents, first of all, we cause our children to believe that their ideas are foolish. We'll look at this more in a few minutes, but there are times as parents that we will ridicule one of our children's ideas, thoughts, actions, because we didn't come up with it, or we deem it, we deem it to be foolish in our superior wisdom. Not that it is foolish. Now listen, children have plenty of foolish ideas. No doubt about that. Why did you think that was a good idea? On, on, on which way did this, you know? But, but we'll look more at this. We can cause our children to believe that their thoughts are foolish that they're not very important. Or number two, when we're self-centered parents, we cause our children to believe that they are unimportant. Number three, when we're self-centered parents, we parent as if we are the only one that matters. You say, well, pastor, who matters? Easy. One word answer, God. God gives to me the priorities in my life and what matters, and God instructs to me as a dad and to a mom and to a son and to a daughter the way we're supposed to act and treat other people. So in this, the question is not who matters, me or Johnny or myself or James or myself or Danielle or myself or Doreen or Doreen. What matters is that I please God. When I am self-centered, the biggest issue is not that I'm ignoring and putting aside my wife and my children. It's that I'm putting aside God and his authority in my life. This is true for all Christians. When I am self-centered, I am now usurping the authority of God in my life and putting myself on the throne. Reminds me of a certain figure in the Bible who said, I will be like the Most High. 
When we decide to run our own life and to make all our own decisions, we are taking the place of the Most High in our life, God. Remember the Bible says, Colossians, that in all things he that is Jesus might have the preeminence, the first priority. When we act this way, we parent as if we are the only one that matters. Now, this particular mindset and attitude will creep not only into, into parenting, but it will creep into marriage. Can I get an amen? It will creep into marriage. It will creep into friendships. It will creep into a job. It creeps into every aspect of life where we begin to place ourselves on the top. We begin to operate like we are the center of the universe and everything else revolves around us. Well, if that's your universe, that is a very small universe. A very lopsided universe that is on a crash course for a cosmic explosion. Your world will get turned upside down. So the deceptive thought, how is this idea shown as a parent? some thoughts tonight inside of this, parents often vacillate, vacillate from either extreme. You have parents who completely focus on their children and their life revolves around their children. Well, guess what? The children are not supposed to be the God in the house, are they? They're not. And parents who almost completely ignore, in one sense, their children. Now, they don't ignore their basic needs, but they ignore some very definite needs. It it's, comes back to having the proper priorities. There are parents, to kind of show this extreme, who try to impose their own pizza preferences on their children. Now, in our family, we have a vast difference of opinion on what should be on top of a pizza. We have the right view. <laughs> Thank you. You don't know what it is yet, but you appreciate the right view. And we have this other view. We have one that I think really pleases the Lord. <laughs> and one that I have to say finds its foundation some other place. You say, well, Pastor, what are those preferences? It would be very plain to explain to you, right? On one side, we have those in our house, those wise, who like and enjoy stuffed crust, meat lovers, toppings, and supreme. Thank you. And then, and then, and I, I, I even shudder to say this in church, but I must. I feel like I must call it out. There are those, and it even comes not close to, uh, not just from the children, but from others in my house, <laughs> who will remain nameless, who enjoy pineapple and ham. God did not make pizza with fruit on it. <laughs> Show me the Bible where he did that. Did not do it. Man. But you know what? My kids aren't stupid for liking Hawaiian pizza. They're not stupid. Just because they don't like what is right and good and <laughs> no, just because they don't like what I like. Right? But we have folks who worry about this, who work through this and can't figure out how to handle this. They go back and forth. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that kids don't have to eat their green beans because kids need to eat their green beans. All right? Yeah. In our house, we are an eat-what's-on-your-plate family. It's the way, that's the way our family operates. I grew up in a family that way. Terrible. All right? I could tell you stories that make your head spin. I'll tell you one. My parents had this horrible rule that if there was a vegetable you did not like, you had the same number of units as the years old you were. All right? So five, five peas. You see the, the connection there. All right, it was fine till you got to like eggplants and, no, and you're 30. <laughs> kids need to the green beans. All right, now I, we don't allow our kids to complain in the house. They still do sometimes, all right, because they're flesh, just like I complain sometimes. I shouldn't, but I do, and so do you. We shouldn't, but we, we do. Um, so how do you work through this? How do you work through these things? And there are different ways to handle that just with food. Let me give you just a real quick thought with food. Um, our kids are allowed to say, um, well, that wasn't my favorite. 
Okay, that's fine. All right, that doesn't mean I hate it. It just means it wasn't my favorite. Do you want more? Well, that wasn't my favorite. Fair enough, fair enough. But they need to eat. I remember when I went on a mission trip with some, some kids, I uh, was in college with some, some kids who had never learned to eat everything. And here we are on a mission trip, and they're turning their nose up at the things that the missionaries and the people of that culture served us. That's awful. That's awful. When I went to Cambodia with the Rupals, they said, what will you eat? I said, anything you put in front of me. Anything you put in front of me. And they took advantage of that. <laughs> if you know Rodney like I know Rodney, then that's why. And we will miss supporting him, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the two sides. <laughs> no. Parents will vacillate. They either dump all in here or all in here, and some are like, that's the way, this is the only way it is, and you will like this, you will like that. Kids are different. Kids are different. I have one child who tried at a restaurant to substitute broccoli for, for French fries. All right, they, wanted, they asked broccoli instead of French fries. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's stupid. What kind of kid is that? It's what the child likes. And the restaurant's like, we can't do that. All right, I said, what? Right? Or my wife said, what? I'm like, I don't care if it costs extra. If the kid wants broccoli, get him broccoli. All right, this is the problem with America right now, and you're stopping this thing. Number two there, parents don't appreciate the differences in their children. Don't appreciate it. There's different likes and dislikes. Well, I know exactly what they should like and dislike. No, you know exactly what you like and dislike. You don't know what they should like and dislike. They have a different outlook on life. Maybe they like to wear a different style than you have. Maybe they have different tastes. Maybe they have different humor. Right? With kids, three different styles of humor in our household. Five with myself and Doreen in there. Right? And things that one child thinks is funny is not always funny. Just the way it is. But I'm not going to say that's stupid. I'm going to laugh with him. My kids like to wear different things. I have one child who wears certain clothes that I probably would not wear. Not sinful, not sinful, but I probably wouldn't wear it that way. I said something to, to this child once, hey, what do you think about this? And they're like, I like this. No problem. I can appreciate the differences and the outlook on life. I was talking uh, earlier, but I've got children and they've got different outlook on time in life. I've got... Um, one child who is extremely quick, organized, and just whoom, on top of things. All my kids wear watches. You know, if you notice this, and they're always beeping, <laughs> always beeping at the most inopportune times during my sermon, you know, things like that. I've got another child who has no concept of time in life at all. They are a free thinker, and they're like, oh, life is good. <laughs> and I'm like, but we have to go now. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. This one particular child who would name nameless, all right, plays soccer. And they'd be the one who I'd say, all right, do you have your soccer stuff ready? Oh, yes, Dad. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right, and then we'd be there to go play soccer. And where are your shoes? Uh, where are your shorts? Uh, where are your, do you have anything ready? Well, I know where it's at. No, you don't. <laughs> now, I want to help them through that, but I'm not going to ridicule them. I'm not going to mock them for that. They're a free thinker. I'm okay with that. They have a different approach, number three, to problem solving. To problem solving. I want my kids to learn how to be a problem solver. One phrase that I do not allow in the house is, I can't. I can't. All right? I can't basically equals I quit. You say, well, Dad, what do we say then if, if we haven't been able to yet? That's what you say. Dad, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've not solved it yet. Great question. I can't says, oh, out of options. Right? Now, side, like rabbit trail, we live in a society of non-problem solvers, do we not? It seems, now, it seems it's like, oh, it's too hard, I can't do it. No, 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 no. But kids sometimes have different approach to problem solving. They need to make something, and they come out with this just harebrained scheme to do this thing. They're using tape and scissors and knives. They use knives in the house. I don't care. My wife seems to care, but I don't care. <laughs> knives and duct tape, and they're using my tools. They just they put them back, and they get this thing together, and it's, it's not bad. 
It's rather clever. I would never have done it that way. All right? Self-centered says, well, that's not the right way to do it. All right? A parent says, boy, that's some, that's some handy thoughts there. You, you solved the situation. Now, there are other ways it could have been a little cleaner, perhaps, but you solved the situation. A couple of years ago, we were doing something, and uh, the kids wanted me to build them something, so I helped them build it, and I let them design it. And they brought me these, uh, these drawings on paper. All right? Now, I'm not a good word worker. They brought me these drawings. I, I couldn't be too angry because for patch plays for years, I've hand-drawn the sets. And every time Steve Evans has helped me, he mocks my hand drawings of these patch play sets. And what you see up here for a patch play, I've typically drawn on the back of a napkin. He's like, boy, are you, are you two and a half, J.D.? What's wrong with this thing? And I'm like, can't you see it? All right, so my kids bring me these things on paper. I'm like, you know, all right, well, do you guys want it like this? Oh, no, those are the same, those are the same level. Oh, okay, it didn't look like that in the picture. They different approach. Ultimately, what happens is parents ultimately prioritize themselves over their children. They give me three big problems with this. Number one, there's no time to be put out. When you're self-centered, you won't be put out for your children. What a mistake. I coach men's soccer here, varsity soccer here, for, I believe, 12 years. During that time, there were a few situations throughout the years where Parents could not make a single, a single soccer game. Single soccer game over the course of a four or five year soccer career. All right, so we're talking 60 to 70 soccer games. I understand their work obligations. I understand that. But you can't tell me that you can't make one game? Just one? Just one? I would see times when a young man would be anxious to have their dad or mom be there. And really, really fell on the dads, dads, to be honest with you. They want their dads to see him. They want their dads to say, wow, that's my son out there. Even if he's making a mess of life. That's my son out there. Go get him. Moms, we know how you react. You yell. Go, go. Early on, we had those three moms. I see Mrs. Gilbert back there. She was one of them. Yelling for those boys. It was you and Mrs. Black. And was it Mrs. Sharkey? Is that the third one? Or to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember you yelling. We know a mom's a dad, but no time to be put out. You get home from work, dads, you're tired. The kid's like, hey, dad, look what I drew. Well, stop and look at it. Stop and look at it. Don't be self-centered. Hey, dad, can we talk about this? No, and listen, we're all guilty of it. Everyone works in here, works hard in here. All right, now your view of working hard may be different than someone else's, but you still work hard. You come home and... You got to be willing to put out as a parent sometimes. Don't be self-centered. Number two, there's no willingness to truly communicate. Now, I'm going to get to this because this is where we really get into some big problems. Parents, when you're self-centered, you have this thought. I know precisely how they need to communicate. They just need to listen to me. All right? That is just a part of communication. That is not complete communication. Try this at home. Husbands or wives, try to communicate just by talking to your spouse and don't listen to them. Let me know how it goes for you. You won't feel like it's communication, will you? You won't. Or number three, there's no desire to invest in their kids. Sometimes your kids are going to need things that you think are a waste of money, that you think are frivolous and useless. And you will think, boy, this is just nuts. We have tried within our budget to invest in our kids. I care about them. I don't mind investing in them. I mentioned many times they play soccer. I've bought cleats. I found them at a store, and I'll buy them and bring them home. This is cool. It costs me just a few dollars. That's easy. When I travel, typically I bring back treats when I travel. They're always glad to see me. I think it's because they love me. All right, sure, it cost me a few things. I found out, um, I think it was a couple years ago, that you should, not, you should not buy your kids the largest mega size of Skittles and put it into your carry-on because no matter what pre-check you have, they will stop you and unload your entire luggage. I asked them, I said, it's, just, it's Skittles, what's going on here? And they said, well, I found out apparently that people hide drugs inside of Skittles. So the TSA agent told me. I said, well, forget that, kids, no more Skittles for you when dad comes home from a trip. If you like Skittles, too bad. You buy them yourself. You will think that's just a waste of money 
and time. Sometimes it's because they see something they want to go pick up, and it's at the store that's 45 minutes away, and it closes in 47 minutes. Can you invest in your kids or not? Sometimes like, hey, Dad, will you watch me outside while I'm doing this? Got a little swing set, and Danielle loves to grab the swing and swing and jump off it. I have watched her jump off the swing countless times. Never grows old for her. <laughs> right, but me, I'm, I'm a dad. If you've seen one jump, you've seen them all. Right, well, why do I stop? Because I'm anxious to see if she'll actually land this one. No, she lands them all. But because she's excited to show me what she's doing on this swing. All right, I can be willing to invest some time in my kids. Self-centered says, listen, dad's tired. I got to go sit down. Mom's tired. I got to go sit down. So what's the correct response? I really want to hit here real quick the correct response. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Here it is. Let each esteem other better than themselves. That has to include fellow Christians. Has to include my co-workers. Must include my spouse. But last time I checked, it probably would include my children. Yes or no? You see that? Let me give some thoughts about that. You can help with your children. Number one, communicate with your children. Communicate with them. I mean talk to your kids and let them talk back with you. Find out what they'd like. Listen to your children. There are some blanks there. Oh, I'll get there just a minute. I almost jumped ahead of myself. Listen to your children, not just talk down to your kids. Or not just lecture to your kids. Some parents think that's what they're communicating when they're just lecturing them over and over. Some questions. Does God, right there, some, I think there's five questions there. Does God listen to us? Out loud, yes or no? Yeah, it does. This. When does he listen to us? Whenever we talk to him, right? Do you ever get a busy signal with God? Ever. Two in the morning. Two in the morning. Now that's when it's tough in the Howell house. In the past, we've had kids wake up and knock on the door. All right, Dad Howell does not like to be woken up at two in the morning. All right? Oh, boy. All right. For some reason, Dad usually wakes up before Mom. This is true. Oh, no. Maybe one, one time you beat me. We both wake up around the same time, and child comes in. There's one that tends to knock on the door more than others. And what's going on? And sometimes there's a nightmare or something going on. Some, and uh, not always the thrilling moment in my life. Not always the thrilling moment. <laughs> I go back to bed. You're fine. You know, Dad, the house is on fire. It'll be okay. Go back to bed. <laughs> I'm okay. But you know, I've prayed at 2 in the morning before. God's never said to me, go back to bed. God listens to me anytime I talk to him. Why should I do the same for my children? Does God allow us to be different than each other? Well, yes. No, I, I, I missed one there for you, didn't I? The very first blank. Talk, listen to us. Talk to us. Allow us to be different from each other. Does God take time for us? Sure. Does God invest in his children? He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. So we ought to communicate with your children. I hope that when they're young, you talk to them and talk with them, not just at them. How are you doing? How was your day? I often drive my kids to school, and on the way to school, I ask them, what's going on today? What are you looking forward to? What do we need to pray for today? And I'll pray with them before I drop them off here. I listen to them. Get back in the car, the ride home. Hey, how was today? What happened? Tell me. I hear all the stories about the rest of the kids at school. You won't believe it, Dad. Oh, I don't believe it. You're right, I don't believe it. Oh, you know what? I got this. And talk to them. Hey, how are you feeling? Sometimes I ask them, what do you want to talk about? Strangest topics. Strangest topics. 
And I'm like, oh, can we talk about rainbows? Okay. What about them? They're pretty. End of conversation. That's okay, though, is it not? Talk to your kids as they become teenagers. Talk to them. Talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. Listen to them. But if you don't establish it when they're young, you won't have it later on. If every time when they're young you just lecture, 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 they will shut you out and turn you off. Talk to them. Let them talk back. Let them communicate back with you. Don't be so self-centered you can't talk to your kids. If you don't get anything else tonight, parents, get this. Communicate with your kids. Talk with them. Number two, invest in your children. Number two, invest in your children there. Three ways, financially. Listen, you can buy things that will help them. Now, some of you are like, oh, I do that all the time. But do you buy it for them or for you? What desires do they have? Like, oh, I'm looking for this one. It's okay that they have different things. And number two, emotionally. Invest in your children emotionally. Positive, uplifting comments. Tell them this. Tell them you're proud of them. Tell them you're proud of them. Feel what they feel. This is harder, all right, for dads, usually, easier for moms. That's why when kids are hurt, they typically go to mom. Moms feel things better. But dads, you can feel it too. Listen, that's tough, man. I'm sorry. That's awful. Man, I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm investing in them emotionally. I'm feeling what you feel. If they're sad, I'm sad for them. I don't want my kids to be sad. Invest in them emotionally. Be able to give, give a wonderful compliments. You compliment a kid and you watch their face light up. Boy, that was great. Wow, that was powerful. Boy, the way you treated that person, that was excellent. That's an emotional investment. Boy, I saw you do that. I saw you, I saw you give that, or I saw you take that initiative without anyone asking. That's emotional investment. These kids are like, wow. You know, you can invest in them instead of them feeling like every time you turn around, you're just tearing on them and, and harping on them. That's going to come as parents, all right, because they'll make enough mistakes. Make sure you invest in them emotionally and, it, and give them positive, uplifting comments. And number three, don't miss this. Invest in your children physically. Now, I have heard and read for years that there's power in touch. The blank there is touch is important to children. And I've read about how with infants, if you don't touch them, that there's some serious um, growth reduction mentally, physically, without the power of touch. Came across this article when I was studying how that it says later on as kids become older and older, hugs become less frequent, back rubs that used to regulate sad feelings become a thing of the past. And parents often, according to this study, believe that physical affection is less important as children age because they don't want to baby them. But they found the study, and it was documented by a number of other studies to support it, that touch at every single life stage is equally valuable. All right, hand on a shoulder, a hug. I don't know if you're a huggy family. I'm Puerto Rican. All right, we hug everybody. COVID was killing me. All right, I'm hugging my kids. I hold Danielle's hand. Well, that's weird, Pastor. That's fine. You don't have to. All right, but there's power in touch. There's power in touch. And I want my kids to know that I love them, appreciate them, and I can teach them the right ways, the right things. When's the last time you hugged your kid? You know, oh, good. You know, 13 years ago. Power and touch. Last tonight, allow your children to be different. All right, now I'm not allowing sin, all right, but they can like different flavors. They can cheer for different teams. Maybe you like sports and they like music. That's okay. Maybe you like to work with your hands 
and they like to work with their brain. That's okay. Allow them to be different. I had a little quote here. Who died and made us the enjoyment authority? We do that, though, parents, don't we? This is fun, so enjoy it right now and smile. Well, maybe they have different, different thoughts in life. Maybe they're just a little bit different and they're geared differently. Last phrase there, I desire to raise my kids, my children, with a humble heart of service, not just for them to show, but for me to demonstrate. Ultimately, it comes down to self-centeredness. If I'm the center of my universe and I think that my thoughts, my likes, my communication, my loves, my investments, those are important. And if they fit with mine, they're great. But if they don't, well, they're foolish, stupid, secondary. And if I'm going to be truly a biblical parent, I must esteem other better than myself. You know what? That's a good idea. If it is. You know what? Let's try that again. You know what? I like you doing that. That's good. Maybe I wasn't geared that way. Maybe you like golf and I don't. That's okay. All right? And we'll invest in that. But you're self-centered. You will ruin your kids. You don't communicate. You will ruin your kids. You'll ruin it. They will not understand right communication in a family. And it'll affect with their future spouse. It'll affect with their future employment. They, um, <laughs> they talk about with sons and their dads and daughters as well that when dads don't invest in positive comments like good job right that a child will have a complex their entire life of trying to gain a father's approval and maybe you've heard the stories i've heard many of them often in sermon illustrations you know the end of the story is where someone puts the note on the grave right their dad i did it I finally felt like something. And it goes back to self-centered parent. Self-centered parent who couldn't see past the end of their nose, who couldn't appreciate a different set of skill set or values. It's all right. So as parents, let's be different. Let's be different.